Uh, thank you, Colonel Warren. Um, thank you all to the press for joining us. Today, we're pleased to introduce Colonel Steve Warren, the Operation Inherent Resolve spokesman, live with us from Baghdad. We're going to have Colonel Warren offer some remarks at the top, then we're going to open it up for Q and A's. I'll be calling on you because even though I'm familiar with you, Colonel Warren may not be. So what I'd ask is that you identify yourself and your outlet before you ask your question. So first, sir, we turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much and good morning. It's a great honor for me to have uh, the opportunity to brief the State Department press corps today. I know you've got plenty of questions and we will get to those, but first I want to give you a quick overview of the military effort here in Iraq and Syria. The coalition is fighting ISIL along three specific lines of effort. Number one, building partner capacity, which is our phrase for training and equipping the Iraqi forces. Number two is advising and assisting indigenous ground forces for their operations, both in Iraq and Syria. And number three is airstrikes. As a part of the wider 60-plus station coalition, there are 18 nations present here in Iraq, with about 6,000 coalition forces training, advising, and assisting the ISF. That breaks out to approximately 3,500 American and approximately 2,500 coalition troops. Training is an integral component to increasing the combat effectiveness of the Iraqi security forces. And when I say for the rest of this briefing the word, the letters ISF, what I'm referring to is the Iraqi military, the police, tribal fighters, and the Peshmerga fighters up north. We've provided basic training to about 17,000 ISF personnel, and we've provided additional specialized training in leadership, marksmanship, engineering, and medical skills to thousands more. I've got a video that I wanted to show you of some of this training. It's bayonet training, uh, which is important. It helps instill a fighting spirit in, uh, in the soldiers here in Iraq. So, uh, Divids, if you can hear me, uh, let's roll the bayonet training video, please. I can't see the video, so somebody will have to give me the high sign. When it's, it's, it's ready. Go ahead, Colonel. All right. Uh, okay, so that was the bayonet training. Equipping is another component uh, of enhancing our combat effectiveness. There's been approximately $2.3 billion total from the coalition allocated to equipping the Iraqi security forces. Of that, $1.6 billion is U.S. funding and is done through the Iraq Train and Equip Fund, or ITAF. Some of that uh, buys uh, 400 MRAPs, which are the uh, mine-resistant uh, up-armored vehicles, uh, Humvees. We purchased uh, 6,000 AT-4 shoulder-fired anti-tank missiles, which have been essential to defeating truck bombs, which are a preferred weapon of this enemy. We've bought 21,000 M16 assault rifles, 20,000 sets of body armor, as well as armored bulldozers, metal detectors, uh, demolitions for quickly bypassing minefields, and of course millions of rounds of ammunition. Moving on to the advise and assist mission, on that we've, we have advisors uh, with five Iraqi Army divisions, four provincial operation commands, uh, the Iraqi Ground Forces Command, the two combined joint operation commands, one each in Baghdad and Erbil, a joint coalition coordination center, uh, with, where both the Kurds and the Iraqi East, uh, Army work together, the 1st Iraqi Special Operations Force, and the Iraqi Air Force. So that's where all our advisors are. The advise and assist mission takes many forms, including support for planning, operations, intelligence, surveillance, reconnaissance, and logistics. 
The last of the three components, of course, are air support. I think you're all familiar with that. Uh, some stats as of January 13th, we've conducted a grand total of 9,627 airstrikes. It breaks out to 6,393 in Iraq, 3,234 in Syria. Okay, so that's, that's that piece of it. Now I want to give you a quick operational update, kind of a once around the, the battlefield. So uh, do you guys have a map in front of you? Can you see that map that I sent? Divis? Or Not yet, Colonel. No map? Okay. I'll okay, just walk through it then. Map. You'll have to take... So uh, we want to go with the one called Opener Map. It's, uh, it's got a lot of red on it. That's the one. Perfect. Okay. Uh, sir, we so here go maps. So here, Colonel Warren, just so you know, you're briefing without the map in the up. So uh, there we go. Go ahead, Colonel. All right, great. So you, you can see a map in front of you. So on this, this is a map kind of of the uh, the operational area up, obviously, is north, down to south. In red is area roughly, this is kind of cartoonish, but roughly uh, where the enemy has uh, presence. So we divide our operations into close and deep fights. The close fights are represented on this map by stars. The deep fights are represented by circles. I'll talk about the close fight first, which are our current operations. Over the past week in Ramadi, which is star one, in the lower right-hand corner of the map, the CTS, or Counter Terror Service, continued clearing uh, south and east through the city center. They've cleared the Grand Mosque, the Al Haq Mosque, the Agricultural College, the Industrial Center, uh, and the Malab Soccer Stadium. The Iraqi Army advanced nearly five kilometers and cleared the Security Service Building. Uh, all this uh, done with the support of 28 coalition airstrikes over the last week alone. In addition, Iraqi uh, engineers have repaired uh, the Qasim Bridge. None of that's visible on this map, but I just wanted you to get a sense for what's happening there. Uh, additionally, in Ramadi, Iraqi security forces have assisted hundreds of civilians who came to them for help. Uh, the ISF gave them food, water, medical attention uh, before they were moved out of the area and into a safer location. Moving around the map, I'm going to move to Beji, uh, which is star number two. So on the right hand third of the map, about halfway up and down. That's Beji, the Iraq, where the Iraqi Army, the Federal Police, the Popular Mobilization Forces all work together to maintain security of the oil refinery. And they continue to conduct clearing operations in the Makul Mountains to the north of Beji City. Moving along to uh, Sinjar, which is Star 3, center of the map uh, towards the top. Coalition forces continue to support the Peshmerga's security operations there using dynamic airstrikes. Dropping back down to the bottom of the map, Fallujah is star number four. Several ISF units are in position around that city, and they've begun operations to isolate enemy forces there. In western Ambar province, from star five and moving northeast, which would be kind of to the from star five up and left, the ISF def recently defeated an enemy attack near a town called Barwana, which is south and east of Haditha across the Euphrates River. Uh, the ISF maintained their positions there with the uh, support of coalition airstrikes, which in one instance uh, over the last several days killed 60 ISIL fighters with a single airstrike. Around the Mara line, which is off the map all the way to your left at star number seven, vetted Syrian opposition forces are operating and have recently seized the village of Harba and Karakubri from ISIL. Star 8 uh, represents the Tishreen Dam. That's also in your upper left-hand corner of your map there. There, Syrian Democratic forces continue to hold despite repeated enemy attacks. Coalition has supported them with air power, conducting 10 strikes just as recently as Saturday to help propel a concerted enemy attack. Earlier in the week, uh, friendly forces there were able to consolidate what we call the FLOT, the forward line of troops, 
between Tishreem and Ain Issa. As a reminder, the SDF, which I'll mention maybe again, uh, is an umbrella group which consists of groups of Syrian Kurds, uh, the Syrian Arab Coalition, Assyrians, and other ethnic groups in northern Syria that are all collectively focused on defeating ISIL. Our deep fights shape the battlefield for future operations. Those are represented on your map by circles. We'll start with circle number one, which is Mosul. Recently, U.S. aircraft struck a bulk cash distribution site, and this is part of our effort to disrupt ISIL's finances. That strike, we believe, deprived ISIL of millions of dollars of operating cash. Circle number two, which is in the center of your map and a little bit left, is Dar Azor, where our focus is something called Operation Tidal Wave 2, which is an operation to degrade ISIL's illicit oil infrastructure. A couple facts on that operation. Since we began Tidal Wave 2, the coalition has conducted 72 strikes against oil targets. We assess that our operation has reduced ISIL's revenue by about 30%. We estimate that ISIL produced 45,000 barrels of oil per day before Tidal Wave 2 and is now only capable of producing about 34,000 barrels per day. So 45,000 before, 34,000 now. And uh, speaking of oil, so I have another video, and no military briefing would be complete without a strike video, so I've got one for you. Uh, this is a video from a strike against a gas and oil separation point in Deir uh from January 2nd. So, Divids, go ahead and roll that strike video. Colonel, the video is complete. So that what that video shows is precision. It's kind of hard to tell if you're not used to looking at these videos. And although some of those strikes may have looked like misses, when you go back and take another look at it, what you'll see is pieces and parts of that um, oil separation point uh, kind of dropping off and, and chipping off and, and rendering that thing inoperative. And that's because we target very specific parts of the infrastructure that we know are difficult to replace and will prevent ISIL from making quick repairs. So a majority of that infrastructure remains, but small yet critical pieces of that infrastructure are, are destroyed with our precision strikes. So to close it all out, the coalition is hitting ISIL across Iraq and Syria. We're killing their leaders at the rate of about one every two days. We're hitting them in the pocketbook. We're enabling ground forces both in Iraq and Syria to take uh, their countries back from ISIL. So with that, I'll take your questions. And I know they told me that the State Department, just like the DOD, the Associated Press, gets the first question. So, Matt, if you're there, what's that? I Matt, am here. Uh, Matt. <clears throat> but I actually don't have a question for you. Um, well, Fair actually, I, I, actually, I do. <laughs> have you? Too late. I'm, I'm wondering, this is the same question I asked uh, Envoy McGurk when he was here not so long ago. Um, and that is, have you seen, I know that there was a concern about the Saudi-Iran split or rift um, having some kind of an effect in terms of, uh, in terms of the fight in Iraq. 
And I'm just wondering if that turned out to not be the case at all, if, if there is no rift, you haven't seen any evidence of that between the, you know, cooperation between the government and the, uh, and the tribes. We have not seen that, and that's a, that's a good question, a fair <clears throat> one. We have not seen that uh, manifest itself here on the ground in Iraq, but I will caveat that with a yet, which I think Sorry, is probably what? sometimes these things take some yet. time to rip. I, I see. Okay. Uh, but as of now, yeah. Okay. And are, is there anything that you're doing specifically to uh, address that, the potential for, for that to happen? Oh, on, the, uh, on the military side, we're not. I know the... Okay. Uh, on the State Department side, the embassy, uh, they do regular engagements here with super leaders of, of all the different flavors here, whether it's Chief, Sunni, PMF, et cetera. Uh, but on the military side, our focus really remains uh, finding and defeating. Gotcha. That's great. I would just remind you, introduce yourself and your outlet. Arshad? It's Arshad Mohammed of Reuters. Um, two questions. One, you said that there were sort of four components to the ISF. Uh, the military, the police, <clears throat> the tribal forces, and the Peshmerga, <clears throat> who are all getting training. Can you tell us roughly how much effort, how much training is going into each of those four groups? And can you tell us whether you judge it to be effective? And if it is effective, why is it effective now in ways that the training was not effective uh, uh, in the prior, you know, decade or, or more, uh, or was not as effective as you had certainly hoped it would be uh, in all the efforts after 2003 to train and equip the Iraqi forces. Sure. So the, the vast majority of our energy goes to training Iraqi army formations, uh, whether those are Peshmerga, of which we've trained about 6,000, uh, or regular Iraqi army uh, in the south. Uh, that's where the, the majority of our training is focused. We've also trained uh, uh, several thousand Sunni tribal fighters. But when I say we've trained them, I have to be clear. That program, the way that program works is that the Sunni tribal fighters will come to one of two locations, to Qadam or, or al-Assad, and the Iraqi security forces uh, train them, and we have forces who kind of oversee that training. Uh, so, but they are still getting trained, and, and they count. And then we've also uh, we also train the local and federal police here, and and the leaders of our police training are the Italian Carabinieri, uh, who have a, a, a robust presence here. They're legendary in their in their police capabilities and how how good they are. And of, of note, uh, and, and the caravan area are great. We see them all the time. We have breakfast with them. And, and I think it's particularly interesting to note that you will never uh, speak with a caravan area officer without, within the first paragraph of your discussion, him pointing out uh, that their uniforms were made uh, by uh, Giorgio Armani. So that's a very point of pride for them. Uh, why is the training effective? I, I, I think the training was effective when we did it back in the 2000s, uh, just as it's effective now. The difference is that when we stopped training the Iraqi security forces uh, in 2011, that force, uh, through bad decisions made by the Iraqi government at the time, uh, through some deliberate, some cases of deliberate neglect, that force uh, became a hollow force. It deteriorated uh, to the point of being combat ineffective. So that when you know when ISIL uh, came screaming through, uh, the the force that was left, the, you know the force, the Iraqi army force that was standing, was simply not up to the task. Uh, so I think that's the difference. So the training isn't much different, uh, but what what's happening is now they're being trained and they're being used. So I had ISIL showed up in 2010. I think the army, the Iraqi army of 2010, it may have been a different story. Impossible to know that. So does that answer your question? Well, why don't you think that the groups that you're now training are, aren't going to get hollowed out uh, and stop fighting? Or <clears throat> well, it's impossible to know that. I mean, I suppose it could happen. What we saw was, I mean, specifically the prime minister at the time, Maliki. Uh, you know, he did a couple of things. 
uh, th that resulted in the Iraqi army becoming a hollow force and, and really kind of rotting from the inside out. Uh, you know, he, he did things like relieve competent leaders, generals, all the way down to lower-ranking officers uh, if they weren't part of his tribe or part of his in-club, etc. Uh, he, he worked funding in certain ways. There was a lot of corruption. Uh, so this was truly an example of, of disastrous leadership uh, from the top resulting in a disaster. Uh, will that happen in the future? It's impossible to know. Certainly, uh, we like to believe that the Iraqis have learned some lessons. Uh, we know that the current prime minister uh, is much more focused uh, on things like reconciliation and, and, and creating national unity. Uh, so uh, we're, we're, we're hopeful that you know, he'll do a better job than the last guy did. And just let, last one, if I may, who's paying the forces? Is the U.S. government actually making direct payments to any of these groups, to the tribal groups, to the Peshmerga? <clears throat> no, the, the Iraqi government pays them all. That's great. Ms. Shah? For the television, uh, Colonel, uh, is there any coordination with the with the Russian forces in fighting ISIL, and how do you view the Russian role in this regard? Um, thank you for that question. Can you ask, can you ask the second half again? I saw. Is there? I heard. Is there any coordination? What was the second half? If there is no uh, coordination, how do you view the Russian role in this regard? I'm sorry, one more time. How do I view... The Russian role in fighting ISIL. The Russian role. Okay, got it. So we don't coordinate with the Russians. Uh, we have a memorandum of understanding uh, that uh, we established with the Russians about two months ago in November, uh, which, which focuses on de-conflicting airspace. In other words... It's a set of procedures that we've agreed to to, pro to ensure safety in the skies. In other words, to prevent our aircraft and their aircraft, frankly, from crashing into each other in mid air. Uh, so that's really all we have with the Russians at this point. We don't share targets with them. Uh, we don't tell them what we're going to do. They don't tell us what they're going to do. Uh, all we do is have some established procedures to ensure that our aircraft don't bump into each other. Uh, Now, on the second part of your question, um, so the Russians, you know, our view is this. The, the Russian you know, presence in Syria has, broadly speaking, uh, been unhelpful. I, we find that their strike tactics are, are reckless and indiscriminate. Uh, we believe that they're uh, pursuing a, a path which is strategically short-sighted. And we find that a majority of their strikes support Bashar al-Assad and his, and his forces. And we believe that Bashar al-Assad, frankly, is the root uh, or one of the major roots of the problem here. He, it, is, it is his policies and conduct which, frankly, has, we believe, uh, given rise uh, in many ways to ISIL. So that's how we feel about the Russians. I have one more uh, two uh, Syrian opposition uh, groups uh, have talked last week about uh, U.S. troops uh, controlling the Shrine Dam in Syria. Can you confirm that? No, the U.S. troops do not control the Tishrine Dam in Syria. Uh, S Syrian forces do. Uh, uh, you know, Syrian opposition forces control it. They fought a, a, uh, a very quick battle. It was, it was they, they met with... Uh, unexpected, to us at least, unexpected success. When they rushed up on the Tishreen Dam, they seized it very rapidly. They were able to push ISIL off of that dam uh, and establish a position of, you know, some high ground about two to three kilometers west of the dam uh, to ensure that moderate range, intermediate range, indirect fires like mortars aren't able to, to, to range them. So a very good operation supported by coalition air power. Uh, and and sin since then, they've beaten back uh, a handful of fairly determined uh, offensive operations. Justin, we'll go to you and then Roz. Please introduce yourself and your outline. Sure. Earl Warren, Justin Fischel, ABC News. Um, I, what's the status of, I hope we weren't just talking about this dam, but the Mosul Dam. Um, there's a lot of concern that, that uh, the integrity of that dam is, is reaching a critical point. What would happen? 
Um, if that dam gave way, and what what are you doing to protect against that? Well, uh, there has been some. You know, we are a little bit concerned about that dam. You know, when ISIL seized the dam a year or so ago, they did two things. One, they chased away all the workers. Two, they stole a lot of the equipment uh, that that was there. It's, since then, the Iraqi we, we of course retook the dam, uh, but maintenance has not kept up the pace. Uh, so that is uh, that is concerning. Uh, the Iraqis have have now they're working with a private company, an international company, uh, to let a contract to restart repairs on that dam. Uh, so that's moving along. Uh, we're confident that once that once those repairs restart. Uh, we think the situation will improve. Uh, you know, if if that dam were to go, I think you know it would be you know it would be a problem, right? I mean, it's potentially catastrophic. Uh, and there's all sorts of models, and the engineers really are the experts in that. Uh, but what we're focused on uh, is really not that dam. That, that's not uh, the, the the CJTF OIR uh, is focused on ISIL. Uh, the Iraqi government is focused on that dam. Great. Thank you, Rob. Hi, Colonel Rosalind Jordan with Al Jazeera English. Uh, I have uh, three uh, quick questions. I'll just put them all out there. First off, the 98-kilometer border between Syria and Turkey that everyone had been focused on in terms of trying to keep foreign fighters from coming from Turkey into Syria, what is the progress in trying to finish closing up that gap on the border? Uh, the next question is the one that people always like to ask, which is, when will the coalition and Iraqi forces try to retake Mosul? How far away, in terms of time, are we from seeing that offensive? And then finally, yes, we are seeing the work that's being done down in Ramadi and Fallujah. What's being done to help the Iraqi military and the local police actually hold that territory so that ISIL can't retake it because it seems that was something that was a real concern early on in the fight against ISIL. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Roz. Three great questions, as I expected. Uh, Syria-Turk border progress. So that, that, that stretch of border, we call it the Manbij Pocket, and that is the area between uh, the Mora Line uh, to the west and the, and the far western edge of uh, what... Um, friendly forces hold, essentially the, the Kurds this year in Democratic forces. So that man bitch pocket, it's a problem for us, right? It's a problem for everyone. Uh, so we've got um, friendly forces to the west of the Mora line who are fighting their way east. Those forces are supported uh, by uh, Syrians who actually trained with us in the now defunct Syria Train and Equip program uh, that was turned off uh, last summer. Uh, but those those forces remain in the fight. They remain in contact with us. They they deliver us uh, uh, some exceptional um, targeting information that we're able to to leverage to to good effect. Uh, so that that but I'll tell you that's a tough fight right now. It, uh, from the, what I've seen, the imagery I've looked at, it, it's very much a World War One style situation. You've got trench lines, uh, bunkers, berms, and it's a fairly static uh, uh, fight right now. And there's, you know, in small, small spots of tremendous tactical uh, ferocity, uh, but they'll battle heavily over, you know, feet or inches even. Uh, so that's what we have on the, on the moral line. Uh, to the other side, uh, where the uh, Syrian Democratic Forces, primarily Kurdish, have kind of extended a little bit west of Kobani, that's really become their limit of advance, so they're not going to go any further. Uh, so we're continuing to support the friendly forces at the moral line who are fighting their way uh, who are fighting their way east. Uh, additionally, you know, by seizing that Tishreen Dam, what we've done is sever uh, a fairly significant supply line between the Manbij Pocket uh, and the rest of ISIL's uh, holdings on the east side of the river. Uh, so that's going to cause that's going to be cause a little bit of a problem for this enemy as well. Uh, when Mosul, uh, so. Mosul, obviously, and you heard this, maybe you heard the Secretary of Defense yesterday speak out of Fort Campbell. Uh, you know, he identified that uh, as one of the two centers of gravity in this fight, uh, with Raqqa being the other center of gravity. Uh, 
uh, ISIL thinks of Mosul as the capital of, of the uh, Iraqi portion of their uh, so-called caliphate, uh, and it it's really one of the keystones uh, to collapsing the, the entire organization. Uh, difficult to say when. The Iraqis uh, are working on the plan now. Uh, we are working with the Iraqis to advise them on how to manage the logistical piece of it, how to manage uh, the integration of air and, and ground operations uh, and other things. Uh, but frankly, there isn't yet a publicly established timeline, uh, and it's going to happen on at, 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 on the Iraqis' timeline. You know, they have to reset uh, after some some fairly tough fighting in the Euphrates River Valley. They have to generate the combat power necessary to seize Mosul, uh, and this is all going to take some time. So I don't I don't have there is no answer yet uh, on when. Uh, how are we helping hold How are we helping hold Romani? Yeah. <clears throat> so the the plan to hold Romani is is we think a, a solid plan. As the Iraqi army clears neighborhoods, they transition those cleared neighborhoods over to either uh, a, Iraqi police, some cases federal, in some cases local, or to um, uh, the tribal fighters, the tribal volunteers. So those are the two groups of, of, of personnel, both of whom have been trained you know, by the coalition, who are designated to hold the territory inside of Romani. And on top of that, you know, of course, we'll continue to see, I think, a robust presence of regular Iraqi army kind of in the outer ring. So I think what you'll, you'll see is police and tribal fighters inside the city uh, and then um, Iraqi army uh, outside the city uh, to, help, to help hold that territory. And then, of course, you know, it's the continued push, right? I mean, we're pushing through the, the Euphrates River Valley, which is north of, of uh, Ramadi, and we're continuing to eat up uh, enemy forces that are there. You know, this, this fight that we recently had in Barwana uh, was, a, was a terrific example of what we see when uh, counter-terror service, who are really the elite forces in the Iraqi army, regular Iraqi army, in this case it was the 7th Division, and tribal fighters all got together and then fought really as a single unit. The, 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 really, the hero of that battle is a Major Razak, uh, who was a counter-terror service uh, battalion commander. He led the counter-terror service battalion that, that moved up from Al-Assad to Barwana. He rallied personally, just using the force of personality and professionalism. He was able to rally uh, the tribal fighters, uh, as well as the 7th Division fighters that were there. They came together, uh, and they, they delivered an old-fashioned whipping on on the um, on the ISIL fighters that were trying to seize Barwana. So, uh, great example of what right looks like, and we hope to see more of it. Go ahead. Thanks. Najib um, Elbisi with a lot of U.S. television. I actually have three quick questions, but Ross asked one of them. But just to follow up on Mosul, um, if the Iraqi army has been able, and this is a big if, to take Mosul, um, does that mean that ISIS forces will be consolidating mainly in Syria now after losing all the major cities, whether it's Ramadi and uh, Mosul and Sinjar? Um, and second is, you said that uh, the Sunni tribes, who many people believe they are um, vital in sustaining the successes in, in Iraq, uh, you said they've been trained by Iraqi forces in Taqaddum and Ain al-Assad. Um, is this any plans? Because they often complain that they don't receive enough arms and they have not been really directly armed. Any plans of, their, of arming them, whether it's by the coalition forces or via the central government in Baghdad? And finally, you said that um, the oil fields that under ISIS control have been um, curtailed from uh, 45,000 barrels a day to 34,000. I'm just wondering, I mean, the number looks insignificant or small at least. What is it that stopped you from hitting them more, especially that you have almost a year of, uh, of operation in, in Iraq and a relatively uh, shorter time in Syria? Thank you. Great questions. Can you, I'm sorry, can you re-ask me the second question about army? All I thought was army. I got where will ISIL consolidate? I got, I got right. that. Uh, I got the oil question. What was the middle You question? often hear a complaint from the Sunni tribes that they have not been armed directly. And you know they are very important to sustain any successes. Any plans of arming them or via the coalition or the central government? Yeah. Okay, great. So your first question, where, where, what's ISIL going to do next really is what you're asking. Will they consolidate in Syria? What's going to happen uh, as we continue to put this pressure on them? 
Well, it's, it's difficult to predict, frankly. We believe that they will kind of contract around their two centers of gravity, right, Mosul um, and Raqqa, right? That's going to be their natural inclination. They'll want to defend the castle. And as you receive pressure uh, externally, you know, in a perfect world, you defend the castle out on the flats first, but then as you receive pressure, you come back to the ramparts uh, and continue to defend the castle from inside. But I, I believe, and we believe, and we're confident, frankly, that it doesn't matter where they consolidate, their defeat is inevitable. Uh, that's coming. Soon, arming the Sunnis. The, the Sunnis are armed uh, by the Iraqi government uh, using weapons provided, weapons and equipment provided by the coalition. So the coalition provides weapons to the Iraqi government, uh, and, and that uh, those weapons and equipment are, are then uh, uh, distributed to either Iraqi army, uh, tribal fighters, Peshmerga, de depending on need and depending on where the priority of supply is based on the tactical situation on the ground. So you know, early on in this fight, the Peshmerga re really received the priority of arming. Uh, when the Peshmerga, when the line kind of stabilized up north, priority shifted uh, to the to the right Iraqi army uh, here kind of in central Iraq. And then as the uh, Ramadi piece is developed, we've seen more and more priority move to the tribal fighters. So we advise the Iraqis on this, but at the end of the day, it's their decision. Oil. Um, One-third is, I think, it, I don't think one-third is small. Uh, I think one-third is, is moderate, maybe, but it's not small. It, it's a third. Uh, why only a third after a year? And that's a very fair question, and I'll tell you exactly why. Uh, we've been striking oil targets since the very first day. On the very first day of this conflict, uh, Admiral Kirby, I recall, stood on the podium in the Pentagon and, and read out uh, that we'd struck an oil target. So we've been striking oil from the beginning. But our strikes initially were ineffective. We didn't know that at first until the operation to seize uh, or to kill or capture Abu Sayyaf. When we captured Abu Sayyaf, or killed Abu Sayyaf, captured his wife, uh, um, and, and took, uh, we really got a trove of intelligence out of that. And as we went through the intelligence and analyzed it and figured out how this enemy works his oil uh, um, operation, we, we discovered two things. One, we discovered that the strikes that we had been doing up to that point were not as effective as we'd hoped. And two, we, dis we discovered more about how the operation works. So late summer or you know august september time frame we reset we really re-examined our target sets uh, we brought in some experts to determine how can we hit these oil sites and damage them but not wipe them off the map because remember we have to think about life after isil as well so we don't want to completely wipe these these infrastructures these pieces of infrastructure off the map what we want to do is stop them from working and that's what you saw in the video right it, you know we could easily have flattened that entire um, oil rig that we showed on that video, but we didn't. What we did was use very precise strikes to destroy key and critical components of that system. And it's components that are either difficult to acquire and replace because they require a level of sophistication to install them or operate them, or you know, they can't manufacture them there given their limited resources in Syria. Etc. So we've done this great analysis, very thorough and detailed analysis of the system, and then we pick very specific spots within that system that will break for longer. So we don't want to destroy in this case because we want it to be able to come up and running when, when the war is over, uh, but we want to break it uh, for a longer period of time. We, we think that's what we're accomplishing at this point. Hi, Colonel. This is uh, Tolga Tanis with Juliet. Uh, I will have a couple of questions regarding this, the clashes in, in Manjip uh, pocket. Uh, how many ground forces are joining the attacks against ISIS, which are uh, trained and equipped by U.S. in Manjip pocket in, in the Mari line? I don't have an exact number. It's, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a small number. It, it's in the 150s, I think, uh, of, of, of uh, forces trained by us. Uh, but in this case... It, What's in a number, right? I mean, these, these, these are personnel who have the most powerful weapon on the battlefield, which is communications. 
with, with a B-1 bomber. So that makes one person worth a lot more than just one person. Are they still paid by U.S.? That's a great question. I don't know. I can check on that, though. We'll get you an answer on that. I don't know if we're paying them. And also, uh, what's the role of the Turkish government in this fight? Because today, Turkish Prime Minister said that 200 ISIS militants will be kill, uh, are killed as a result of the Turkish artillery shots against ISIL targets. Are they supporting this offense against ISIL target in Mambish pocket? Well, we've seen the Turkish uh, fire some artillery to very good effect uh, in the Mambish pocket. Uh, we're continuing to work with the Turks to tighten up our coordination with them on, on these uh, artillery strikes that they do in that area. Uh, but yes, they are. So they are not under the, the umbrella of coalition, this, this artillery shot? No, they, they are. Uh, but we still need to work on our coordination. What, um, what kind of coordination? Can you uh, more, I mean, give some specifics? The targets or the, 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 the groups that they are supporting? What, what, what kind of coordination are we talking about? We are. want to ensure that we know exactly where they're going to strike before they strike. Uh, and this is always the case in any, one, in any type of a large outfit uh, with, with as many moving parts as we have in this coalition, that's going to happen. So we've identified as the Turks filling a need, right? There were some weather problems. We were having difficulty uh, providing the type of air power we wanted to provide. And the Turks filled in with artillery fire. So it was perfect. It happened the way it was supposed to happen. But my point is, you know, this is a disparate battlefield, right? We have a headquarters here uh, in Baghdad. We have operations being conducted all the way over on the Mora Line. We need to continue to work on, on finding our level of work. Last one. La uh, last one. So uh, it happened the same thing last weekend, actually, last week. Uh, when I asked the pet, pet rider during the SANCOM briefing, he said that the attacks of Turks uh, that they are conducting against ISIL are not the uh, under the force of the anti-ASL coalition. So we have host countries, Syria and Iraq. We have two blocs, Iranian and Russians, and the U.S.-led coalition. And we have Turks as a for force in this fight. It's a very crowded battlefield. That's great. Dave? Uh, yes, uh, I'm David Clark from AFP. Uh, I've seen reporting here that, um, uh, that suggests that you may have be tiring out your best forces, and uh, there, there are caveats on how, on how they are able to operate. The Kurds have reached the limit of what they would regard as, as, as Kurdish lands now, almost. Uh, in Syria, certainly, they probably won't go any further west, and there's a question about whether Peshmerga forces could be used effectively in, in Sunni Arab Mosul. And now your uh, counter-terror services, uh, Colonel Razak and his men, they fought a very big fight in Ramadi. They're probably going to be moved on. And behind them, the other forces are less experienced, and your best forces are tired or have reached the limits of their territory. Is it, uh, yeah. is it sustainable? Yeah, uh, that's a fair question. We believe it is sustainable. A couple of things. Uh, you're right on the on the Kurds. They kind of they're probably not going to move too much further south. Although there's there is still some room uh, to work uh, on the CTS, the Counter Terror Service. Yeah, they are tired. You know, they are they are the elite force in in this army, uh, but it's a war. So your elite force is going to get tired in a war. Uh, that's how it is. Uh, and they're very proud and very effective, and they're going to continue to fight. We believe they're 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 a good solid force. And the Iraqi army, uh, who is, you know, really the main bulk of the combat power here, uh, we're watching them get better every day. Uh, you know. Uh, it was the Iraqi army who provided the bridging assets across the, the Tharthar Canal uh, in Ramadi, which allowed the CTS to cross and, and, and you know, kind of be the tip of the spear into downtown Ramadi. But it's the 8th Iraqi Army Division, which is, which is clearing from the southeastern corner of Ramadi, north and west. Uh, it was the Iraqi 7th Army Division, uh, again, certainly led uh, and, and rallied by CTS, uh, but it was an Iraqi Army Division who, um, in Barwana, uh, provided the bulk of the combat power there. And it was Iraqi uh, engineers driving armored bulldozers, Iraqi uh, tankers driving M1 tanks down the, the streets of, of Ramadi uh, that really uh, have allowed uh, the situation there to stabilize. Uh, and nothing uh, can defeat an enemy truck bomb faster than an M1 tank. Uh, so we are seeing the Iraqi army bring its game up. Uh, we've, again, we've trained over 16,000 of them. We're going to continue to train them. We're going to continue to 
train them at a, to a higher and higher level. Uh, we believe that uh, they will, over time, develop the strength and combat power needed to, to, to finish off this fight. And, and remember, you know, it's important to know, one of the things we know in the Army is that success breeds success, right? Confidence builds more confidence. And so the Iraqi Army has seen, a, you know, a fairly good string of victories, right? We're kind of going at the clip of about a major city a month, if you think about it, right? Tikrit, um, Abeji, Sinjar, Ramadi. Right, so uh, the success is beginning to build on itself. We see the Iraqi army moving differently. We see the Iraqi army beginning to act differently. Uh, we are focusing our training in certain areas that we know will will uh, amplify that even more. Uh, so certainly everything you point out is something we need to think about and keep an eye on, uh, but we believe that there's a plan in place that, that uh, will move us ahead. And you don't think the Iraqi government would be tempted to fall back on the popular mobilization uh, forces? Uh, in areas that have been recaptured? Well, you know, it's an Iraqi government decision. We, we would prefer the Iraqi government uh, to lean most heavily uh, on uh, the regular army and the CTS. I mean, we've been around a day or two, so we understand that the PMF uh, is, is part of the apparatus here. So, I mean, we understand there's a place for them. Uh, but what we want to see is the focus of the Iraqi government and the, and the, the kind of the linchpin of the Iraqi security apparatus, the the army. Kim, if you could introduce yourself in your outlet. Kim Dozier with the Daily Beast. Uh, as the Secretary of Defense yesterday asked that the Expeditionary Targeting Force has fully deployed and arrived in Iraq, um, can you shed any light on how it will coordinate with Iraqi security forces and the Peshmerga? Kim Dozier needs no introduction here uh, with anyone in uniform, uh, so it's great to see you. Um, so the secretary uh, did announce that the ETF uh, that he had ordered here uh, is on site, and, and they will uh, continue to build up their, establish themselves, and, and get ready to, to begin operations. Uh, we are, I'll, I'll be honest with you, and I know this is not the answer anyone wants, we're going to be very hesitant to speak publicly about uh, the ETF or about uh, any other special operations forces. Uh, we believe that these forces draw their strength uh, from operating the shadows, from their secrecy, from the mystery that surrounds them, and and we're going to we're going to facilitate that by um, studiously ignoring any questions about them. That's great. I, I wasn't asking for. A Anything tactical, I'm uh, curious about how uh, the Iraqi government and the U.S. military will sort of coordinate, you know, who makes the call um, on strikes inside, strikes outside. Yeah. So uh, in every case, uh, every, every bomb that we drop in Iraq has an Iraqi uh, government official sign off on it. Every single one, 100%. Uh, and, and that's important. So the, the, the lines of communication, the coordination mechanisms are long established. We have a joint operating center about 100 feet away from me here, where, which is chock full of Iraqi generals, uh, Iraqi officers, and coalition officers and, and generals. Uh, so the, the coordination mechanism uh, is, is set uh, and it's strong. Um, and so, so that will continue. So all we will do is any additional asset that is plugged into this broader uh, um, operation will simply plug into the already established lines. Uh, you know, the commanding general, General Lieutenant General Sean McFarland, uh, has weekly engagements at the very highest levels of the Iraqi government and Iraqi military uh, over across the street at the at the U.S. Embassy. Uh, the U.S. Ambassador has weekly engagements at the very highest levels of the Iraqi government as well. So the, the connectivity is there. So any additional asset that comes in, it will just plug into that connectivity. That's great. I want to thank Colonel Warnett, Warren from joining us from Baghdad. We'll make sure we get the maps, the video links out to you soonest. This transcript will also be available, and this video will be available at Divid. So thank you, Colonel, for joining us. Any last words? Well, Thank you very much. I'll tell you, we, we, so we did, a, uh, we did a Twitter town hall yesterday, which I'd never even heard of and didn't know what to expect. But it was a lot of fun. I'm going to do another one. So if any of you are out there not following me, at OIR Spokes, O-I-R-S-P-O-X, 
I encourage you to do so and look out for the next Twitter town hall. Thanks for this privilege. It's been great. You guys ask terrific questions. You're not nearly as scary as Admiral Kirby told me you were, and I look forward to doing this again. Take care. Thanks, you guys. We'll see you at 2. Thank you, Colonel.